Now therefore I, Jim Green, on behalf of Larry Campbell, Mayor of the City of Vancouver, do hereby proclaim Wednesday, May the 19th, 2004, as Jane Dickens Ideas Day in the City of Vancouver. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, City of Vancouver. <laughs> I never thought I'd get something like this. <laughs> Steel and ribbons and everything. It's the little things that count. Uh, well, the, I, I'm going to ask Jim if there's any reading from my book, whether he will do it, because uh, I am having some eye trouble, and I am a living example of what happens when the provinces strip the health services. <laughs> Uh, Jane, I think what we decided was that rather than reading from the book, you could just kind of summarize what you thought were the, the most important parts for people to hear who haven't read the book yet. Is that okay to start that way? Sure. Okay. Uh, the title sounds very gloomy, uh, but it isn't. I, I think you will find if you read it that it isn't that gloomy. It's also a hopeful book, and I wrote it with a good deal of hope. Uh, it's a wake-up call. Uh, yes, if we keep making mistakes and muddling into things, mostly with good intentions, but things with uh, unforeseen results, um, we will be in very bad fix. I don't think it's an, an exaggeration to say uh, we could... Uh, oh fall into a cultural dark age. But we haven't yet reached a point of no return. Um, our uh, difficulties becoming so intractable and so large that there's just no way to deal with them. In fact, one of the main things that I hope this book puts across is to assure people that our problems are not too big and too intractable for people to deal with. Um, actually, the doing the wrong things in cities, doing the destructive things, uh, is usually more expensive, not only in the long run, but the short run, too. Uh, more expensive, more wasteful, and more difficult, uh, takes more effort than doing things right. Um, the, what worried me enough that I wrote this book uh, with this wake-up call and this warning uh, is that what I call pillars of the culture. And the way I use culture, it means everything. It means our politics, it means our uh, economics, it means our way of life, our relationships with one another in our society. Uh, everything that attaches to everything else and affects everything else, and that makes the grand thing we call culture. Uh, what I worried about in particular is the five, what I call five pillars of our culture seem to be rotting at present in obviously a bad state. 
And that, that is worrisome because these pillars are stabilizers. We count on them. We take them for granted to help um, correct mistakes. And if stabilizers um, begin to go, then we're in a fix. Uh, I'll tell you what the, I uh, analyzed as the uh, five pillars that seem to be in jeopardy. Um, they are in, in order, the order I'll give them is not necessarily the order of their importance because they all weave in to each other. You can't say one is more important than the other. The, but the first one I deal with is uh, family and community. Both of them are in deep trouble in our culture. Uh, you can't consider family without community, and you can't consider community without family and also uh, households, which are a different kind of unit, but often overlapping with the family. The uh, second one is uh, higher education, like here. <laughs> uh, it's in jeopardy because the notion that it is a prime method of passing down culture from one generation to the next um, is losing out, has largely lost out to the idea that a higher education is an isolated uh, thing dealing with individuals and the chief purpose is not education but letters after the name, uh, degrees, credentials, and universities differing in different departments of course and in different universities themselves have largely become credential factories in the last generation and uh, really good education has been sacrificed to manufacturing credentials uh, and which I thought of and treasured to a great extent uh, for rather narrow economic purposes uh, rather than for continuing that we have a culture in which people know a lot of important things. Uh, the third one is obviously related to this. It is uh, a betrayal of science and scientific evidence. But um, this is not really the fault of anybody. In fact, in general, I'll interrupt myself for a minute, in general, uh, I have nobody to blame for what's been happening. Nearly everybody involved in it and every, in, the, the, every uh, thing, every event in this decay, this progressing decay, um, has been done actually, drifted into with good intentions. Usually with short term good intentions and neglect of long term uh, good intentions, but still good intentions. And I have tried to show how this drift occurs. Um, in the case of science, it's a particularly difficult uh, drift for the worst to uh, correct uh, because science itself, uh, which is not very old in our culture 
and the cultures from, from which we descended um, depends very much on reduction of the real world to oversimplification. And that's inevitable because it's so hard to, be, to compare more than two things to each other. And three is much more difficult. And four, five, six, oh my, it gets Im seemingly impossible. So science began in Western Europe and in our culture, our more localized culture, with comparing two things. This is called bivariate reduction. Um, just because it was more practical and easy to do. Um, a common and early bivariate was to compare the temperatures at which uh, matter changed its nature, uh, such as what temperature uh, was necessary to um, melt ice, what temperature was necessary to solidify a liquid, what temperature uh, turned uh, water into steam or governed other gases. Uh, if you forgot about any other properties that were concerned in this, it was very practical and very stunning at first, of course, to show that this you could begin to understand the world this way. Now, everything like uh, the need for housing of different at different incomes, the um, uh, actuarial tables of insurance companies, the uh, marks that children get in school, all kinds of other things uh, could be analyzed almost easily uh, when they were seen as disorganized complexity. Uh, a whole lot of separate things and by the law of averages. Uh, you could statistically uh, understand or analyze the differences uh, in there, in that lump of disorganized complexity. But that also was not comparisons of lots of things that do touch each other. So how did human beings uh, contend over the years with other kinds of science, with the relationship of everything to everything else, which is the real story of the real world, uh, and very important scientifically. In biology, for example, uh, there's very little that you can understand by the two methods I just mentioned the bivariate comparisons and the disorganized complexity um, statistics. And yet we have been getting to know more about biology and its complexity, which is enormous. We can call that organized complexity. Uh, so going back to my question, how have human beings dealt with this? Which they, they have. They deal with it through stories. Uh, human beings are story-loving creatures. If we found the animals as attracted and attached to something, as human beings are to stories, uh, we would think it was very important for their survival. I think it is for human beings. And we're in the theater with, right, 
that is dedicated to telling stories. Uh, it shows how the works that are done here show how things are connected with each other uh, through the form of plays, and they are shown uh, also in films and in other creative writing. The earliest uh, uh, way in which human beings saw stories as telling really what went on in the real world was poetry, especially epic poetry. Very important. Um, but science, unfortunately, as we know it through the reductive uh, methods, um, scientists got very snooty about stories. <laughs> uh, they despised what stories were telling us uh, as uh, anecdotal evidence. Oh my, that's just anecdotal evidence. And that illustrates something that shows up in a dying or decaying culture generally, that there are uh, ideologies that are so taken for granted that many people don't even recognize they have it, these ideologies, these dogmas. And the worthlessness of anecdotal evidence is one of those dogmas. Um, and we have to become a, more aware than we are. This is a bedrock thing, not just about stories, but about all kinds of ideologies that we use uh, in a soulful way, you might say, to avoid thinking. But actually, I believe that we evade these things and uh, ignore them, much at our peril. Uh, not so much uh, through sloth as through people who believe them don't want their world view changed. I mean, people who believe that anecdotal evidence is useless and is always trumped by statistics about very narrow things, uh, they don't want their world view changed. It's very upsetting and disturbing. We all need to look and see what attachment we have in that way, what emotional attachment that we pretend is intellectual. Um, You're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, we're on the right road still. Okay, uh, the, the next one we were going to mention was taxation. Yes, and that is a trouble over all the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's the short version. <laughs> yeah, that's the short version. <laughs> <laughs> Legislatures everywhere uh, try to make one size fit all in their laws because they absolutely can't encompass the detail. Um, that is necessary for understanding not only a settlement, a city, a town, um, but also uh, how we are different at the same time from each other. They're different in their needs, they're different in their opportunities. And trying to make one size fit all uh, is the more successfully it's done, the more it kills the uh, the thing it supposedly loves. Um, and that's the way we deal with taxes because they are very centralized and we are not that centralized in reality. And as Marshall McLuhan remarked once, I don't think he wrote this, but we were talking once and he said this, 
You can't decentralize centrally. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> and you try to withdraw taxation and powers connected with it from any level of government, and you've got a battle on your hands. Uh, and we are very uh, much aware of this, or should be, in Canada. It means that people who don't know the details of what they're legislating about uh, are having their biggest say about it, and they make very dumb decisions because they don't know enough, intimately enough, and they can't. So that's a systemic um, shortcoming built into the system and very much built into the Canadian system. Um, the last of the pillars that uh, I excoriate are, is really the one that most deals with human weakness. And this is the uh, self-regulation and sometimes self-pleasing even of uh, the learning professions, many of them professions that people here at UBC are studying. Uh, accounting is a kind of top one of these because it, it not only is supposed to govern itself wisely and honestly, but also uh, commercial uh, organizations and the commercial part of the culture of all kinds, because um, commerce is not considered a learned profession, and it needs, it's not expected to govern itself the way a uh, learned profession is. I think this is because learned professions all derived originally from priesthoods, but commerce did not. Um, but the, but the other professions, uh, you know, law, medicine, uh, the police, too, of course, uh, they're all supposed to be pretty good at regulating themselves, and including the uh, priesthoods themselves, as they've been derived. And you only need to look at the daily papers to see what trouble most learned professions are in when they are nowadays are trying to govern themselves. They're very messy. Um, and people are losing respect for them uh, on that account. Uh, I don't know how they will recover. Uh, well, this sounds very gloomy, too, doesn't it? <laughs> but actually, these are not great big intractable problems, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they are within human scope. And they, uh, people who are affected by them uh, are usually on the right track through plain common sense. The, the common sense of ordinary people is what will save us, or the loss of common sense among ordinary people is what will do us in. Well, I've talked enough. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. So what I thought we would do, Jane, I don't think that most people have had the opportunity to read the book because it's only been out a few days. Um, and incidentally, uh, May the 4th was Jane's birthday, and the book came out shortly after that. So. That was coincidence. I wasn't making a birthday present to myself. <laughs> there's, there's a few things that I would like to then just talk to, to you about, and, and that's some of the... Um, 
the ways in, in this new book, which is carries on a lot of themes in Jane's earlier books, um, uh, systems of survival and uh, nature of economies. Uh, these books were very instrumental in my thinking and, and many other people's. But the idea of the of taxation is one that really struck home to me. That now that I'm a city councilor, especially. And, and that is your statement that the progressive taxes, the ones that are based on either growth or ability to pay, uh, are not, those taxation powers are not allowed to be had by the municipalities. So the municipalities get the dumbed down tax, which is property tax, mm -hmm. right? And we at the city, for instance, for instance, we put up $400,000 to bring a million people to Vancouver to see the fireworks. And as a result of the taxation, we pay it out from money we received from taxpayers. And then businesses and the federal government and the provincial government both get a return on that. And the city doesn't get a penny. And that's a real problem for municipalities being able to deal with all the issues, and especially more and more that are downloaded to us from senior levels of government. Mm -hmm. So, And they're often... The taxes that are downloaded on us are often the counterproductive. Now, just think, for instance, about our roads, our highways, especially our limited access highways. These, think of the money that has been spent on them, billions of dollars in Canada, and even in single large cities and the effort that has been put into them. And yet the more roads that are built, the worse traffic becomes. Something is wrong there. <laughs> this is true. And one of the statements that, uh, that I think is so incredible in, in the book that, uh, that I, I really want to use more and more, and I know that uh, other people in the city do, and Jane points out that traffic engineers tell you that Traffic is like water, right? If, if it flows in one way, and if you block that flow, then it's going to flow in another way, right? But you find that not to necessarily be true. No, the evidence shows it's not true. But if you bring up the evidence, oh, that's anecdotal evidence. <laughs> <laughs> but you say that actually from 20 to 60 percent of traffic vanishes when you close a street. <laughs> right? Yes, and some uh, people now, and not in Canada, but in England and in some other places, who have noticed this, um, but haven't given the study it should have, even, even in these other places, um, they say, of course, um, in adding uh, new highways increases traffic congestion. Of course, subtracting highways should eliminate something. Perfectly logical and scientific. <laughs> but nobody's been paying attention. It disturbs their worldview terribly. <laughs> It, it would. And another statement you make that's related to that is in terms of um, traffic engineering. And I had it here a second ago. I might have lost it. Um, but you say that the journey means more than the destination in, in traffic planning. Mm -hmm. and, and what you mentioned at times is things like elevated highways tearing up the neighborhoods that you'd like to get to. You know, the, the logic of it is exactly what you say, that the journey is more important than the destination. Which is not true about cars and roads. It may be true as a philosophic uh, suggestion about the conduct of a life, but that's a different matter. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> that is very true also. Um, 
We had another situation in Vancouver. I kept, while, while I was reading the manuscript, thinking about how all these ideas have applied. And they've been applying to Vancouver for so long. Jane's work, her, her ideas have been so important. And the fact that we do not have an elevated freeway system goes right back to Greenwich Village and the work that Jane did there with um, a person who was on the other side, uh, Mr. Moses, who was trying to put freeways everywhere. And we learned from Jane about that. But um, one of the things that I just noticed the other day, too, about traffic engineering is that we have a heritage building that is suggested that we'll move it for a million and a half dollars in order to make sure that the traffic grid stays straight. <laughs> right? So these values that come out are completely different. And, uh, and I had a talk with uh, John Ralston Saul, who gave me a, a great example, too, is that Rideau Hall, they scraped the roads every year, and he was upset with so many signs, at speed limit signs. So he asked them to stop scraping the roads and take down the speed limit signs, and the accidents went way down, right? Because people couldn't drive as fast. And I, I, <laughs> I think it's, it's logical, too, that we could control traffic by leaving the Heritage Building there and saving a and million and a half dollars. Um, one, of, one of the most important things in the, in the book that really got to me and I think that many of us would, would say this too, is the idea of the history of zoning and how zoning has determined how we live in our cities. And you say that it was in 1916 in North America where zoning became the dominant way of programming well, cities. Transfer tool. And I remember the date because it's the, the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Which gives you an idea how old um, um, these tools are. And <laughs> and how much other things have adapted and changed. Even I have adapted and changed. <laughs> but the three chief um, assumptions behind the zoning that has made our suburbs and some parts of older cities <clears throat> and some changes in them are these three beliefs that high densities are bad number of people per acre or number of families per acre um, that high ground coverage is bad and that mixed uses are bad now, these are all profoundly anti-urban notions. And insofar as they are based on anything, including anecdotal evidence, um, is from the days when we really had no public health measures uh, and a lot of other things we gradually got, and the zoning did not adapt to this. Um, cities with sustainable economies and cities that people still like to go to are ones that flout this zoning. And here I think we can begin to see in some historical sense what our uh, urban sprawl means. It's really uh, a midpoint, I think, um, not accurately right in the middle, but it's a midpoint of, um, of intensity of land use. The farmers who sold the, the land to developers, uh, the, what they were selling was uh, and what made our suburbs and our sprawling suburbs in particular possible was uh, land use that was a very low intensity under agriculture. And there's a whole other story behind that too uh, about the plantation age which is what was responsible for most of our success with agriculture. 
But the farmers often didn't like to sell the land to the developers. But the, it was a win-win situation. Here were farms that were very family farms that we sentimentalized, but it's a really a very hard life, a family farm. And uh, the hard work does not yield very much. Uh, and there, you know, other possibilities had appeared. Uh, young people on family farms necessarily want to carry on that life. They sell other ones. And that they could go to the University of British Columbia and get another life for themselves. If they get the credentials. If they got the credentials. Uh, but, but now, you, now we call this sprawl, this low intensity. Um, use of land but it's not the lowest intensity now we're beginning to see that it needs to be densified or it can't support uh, the infrastructure it needs it can't support the transit it needs uh, all kinds of things are skewed because uh, uh, an impossible situation, economic situation, has been created. So that's why I think the, the sprawl, the medium density land use, is a midpoint between, some kind of midpoint between high uh, um, density high intensity of land use which is coming and I'll tell you in a minute why it's coming uh, and a very low intent intensification of land use and people I think in the future historians looking at this and of how we uh, struggle with the idea of suburbs and zone them to be uh, unsuitable uh, as in their intensity of land use. We'll see it as a, a midpoint of some kind. Um, now, why is that going to change? Because Today I heard on the on the radio, I was talking about these things, and lo and behold, now we'll take a break for the commercial. And what was the commercial? It was telling us that, do you want the vacation you've always dreamed about? Well, uh, your mortgage makes it possible. <laughs> Uh, do you want a larger home? Do you want a more expensive home? Uh, just see the such and such capital company uh, which understands things that even banks don't understand. Uh, that you have, you have built up in your home an equity that makes it possible for you to buy a much larger and better home. This is dependence on um, the speculated value of a home, the inflated value, that isn't supported by anything except uh, bubble stock. <laughs> and one consequence is that Canadians and Americans owe more than has ever been the case are in debt more. And they're in debt because they keep borrowing on this inflated cost of their houses and they get vacations that they never dreamed of. <laughs> <laughs> and 
the bubbles like this always burst. They're, um, it's impossible to sustain them forever. You can sustain them until after the next election, and maybe the next election. But uh, they're very speculative, and there's no true additional value being added. So that's the end of And that's one very concrete reason we can expect uh, a dark age ahead, meaning a very, very hard times economically when uh, money will not grow in houses anymore. <laughs> and when people will have to, who want their houses to support them, their houses and lots, will have to find ways that they actively uh, support them instead of passively just by being there and by somebody informing you of what your mortgage is worth now. And that will come, I think. There are no end of ways in which it can come if the uh, car dependent, excessively car dependent, <coughs> Uh, transportation system of the suburbs breaks down. Um, that will be one one way the bubble may start bursting. Uh, if the oil runs out, uh, that will be another possible way. But demo, de demographics, regardless of what happens, uh, are going to be a way that the bubble bursts. That is, uh, people cannot support any longer the houses, but as they, especially as they get older, the houses and lots that they could when they were younger. They can't do the chores. They can't I know all about this. <laughs> uh, they don't need the space. Uh, they we will very likely uh, want to sell them either to developers who will see possibilities of um, lower of lower income housing that can be added more densely, or they will think of ways to um, uh, densify themselves, the places themselves. And uh, cities that have a good tradition of this in their old streetcar suburbs, um, like uh, Kitsilano is a wonderful example, uh, they will do it very beautifully uh, by example, by adding what are called coach houses on empty places uh, or where the barbecue used to be. Uh, and adding different uses. And there are all manner of different uses that can pay more rent and use part of the main house, maybe the whole main house, former main house. Um, or additional uh, buildings, um, nursery schools, um, live-work studios, uh, all kinds of home businesses, uh, people who do, do your hair, uh, uh, all kinds of special schools. You just name it or look at lots of retail places um, because, and these things are needed. They are uses that were zoned away and are really needed and can possibly um, not only densify uh, places with very low intensity of land use, but uh, 
can make them far more convenient to live in and far less car dependent. Correcting many things at once because of this uh, ability of things in the real world to affect and be affected by many more things than two. <laughs> Jane, I, w I want to go back for one thing that I find to be absolutely important in this work, and that is the difference between zoning and performance codes. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think performance codes are really the way that we're going to have to go if our cities are going to be the vibrant places that we want them to be. Can you take a moment and explain to people what performance codes are? Well, you know, uh, you can't just let things um, happen any old, any old which way. Things can get worse. They can get terribly worse. And if you go to a zoning hearing and you hear people protesting at the zoning hearing against their zoning being changed from they it turns out that they aren't really talking about that. They don't give a damn how about uh, density being reduced from or enlarged from 29.6 individuals per acre to uh, uh, 31.8 individuals per acre. The very fact that people have to be divided in decimal points <laughs> shows how really abstract in this thing. <laughs> and nobody cares about those figures, but they do care, and they often vociferously protest against the change in the zoning because of quite other things. And if you listen, you begin to hear what they feel. Um, for a while, when I had time, I would go to zoning hearings just to hear what people fear. <laughs> um, they fear bad smells. They, they fear um, losing their views. Um, they really fear that in Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. And with good reason. With really good reason. All of these are with good reason. All of these are common sense things of ordinary people. Um, they fear heavy through traffic. Um, and when they complain that might happen, the traffic engineers just tell them lies. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Um, the traffic engineers have very fragile world views. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, uh, but, but with performance, when we look at performance rather than zoning, which is boxing things and telling people how many decimal points they, they get. Uh, you say that um, for an enterprise, um, how an enterprise can find sounds within its premises uh, should be of no concern to the performance code. As long as they can find them. So if you can find a way to control the noise, it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter to the, the regulators, the city, on how you do that. Whereas in zoning tells you exactly how you're to do that. Is that correct? Zoning just outlaws all kinds of uses on the assumption that they will make noise and there will be no progress in uh, confining or damping down noise. When I read this, I couldn't wait to read you the definition of a class one restaurant in the city of Vancouver. <laughs> okay, do you mind? No, I'd like to hear the definition. <laughs> I bet it has nothing to do with how things taste. <laughs> uh, 
Have you been reading our zoning bylaws? <laughs> okay, here you go. Restaurant, class one, means any premises used for the sale of pre prepared food to the public or at least 17 seats of any kind in <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. Including chairs, stools, and seats on benches, whether inside or outside, are provided for customers consuming, consuming food purchased in the establishment, where any live entertainment is provided by no more than two persons, and where there is no dancing by customers. <laughs> And no use of any amplified musical instruments. That's what a restaurant is in Vancouver. <laughs> and it doesn't mention taste. <laughs> but by using performance codes, and that's what we're trying to do now, we're saying that we're going to get rid of all of that, and if there are noise complaints, we'll deal with the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, as a guy said to me, the way this reads now, you can have two mimes performing in a restaurant. <laughs> But three mimes are too noisy. Should we open it up to some questions? Okay. We have time for a couple of questions? Okay. So now we're going to open it up for, uh, for questions for Jane from the audience. There's a mic here. And I'm going to repeat the questions once you ask them. Well, if there are no questions, we could go to the restaurant review section here. <laughs> this could be your moment, folks. Oh, here comes. Oh, no, he's a traffic engineer. No. <laughs> oh, here we go. May I make a suggestion? Certainly. Well, one thing that distresses me uh, very much, and that I didn't put into the gloom of the title, is... Um, I hear a lot of things that sound so great. Um, well, it's nice to hear things that sound great. People have, you know, the right, right idea. Um, but then I am very distressed when I find that what is done, what is performed by those, these very people that talk such a good line, um, contradicts what they say and it seems as if this is not sunk in somehow uh, and when what I have written is parroted this way I am very distressed about it it's as if I'm being co-opted for bad purposes and um, this is all very nice as proclamation of Jane Jacobs' ideas, but if what is being proclaimed is uh, how we are going to flout Jane Jacobs' uh, ideas, I don't appreciate that so much. <laughs> I hear that. Now we have a young lady that has that. Hello, I'm Vanessa Timmer, I'm a student here at ABC, and my question was that I was just looking into the idea of a livable city, and as I was thinking about livability, I, I kept having to think about, at a bigger level, first the region and the country, and then I started thinking about a livable city within a livable planet, and I just wanted to hear your comments about how you picture the city now that we're looking, I guess, at the planet scale in terms of nature, human interactions, that kind of thing. Okay, the question is, how, how do you see the city affecting the world? In other words, what we do in cities, if I understood it probably, how can we make the world better by the actions that we take in the city? Well, there are many ways. And one of them is by not being wasteful which affects the whole world, not being vandals, not being too specialized, which is another way of wasting places in the world, because places that get too specialized 
always lose out. They, uh, what they're specialized in becomes obsolete or the resource runs out or a bad management hurts it or um, people get tired of it. You know, one of the great things about human beings is that we have a very, very low tolerance for boredom. <laughs> and that keeps us hopping. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what, what, oh, what can we do to, well, it's stopping doing bad things, <laughs> and of which I've mentioned a few in a broad abstract way, and also providing <coughs> for people what cities have provided in our culture since early medieval times when there was a slogan, city air makes free. People who were bound as peons, um, who had no future and neither did their children or grandchildren, uh, if they could get away from the plantation and get to the city, uh, they were liberated to have more opportunities. And that people can still do that for the rest of the world, city people. You said in one of your earlier books that, um, that cities are the, um, the doors to creativity. Yeah. And if we can, if we can use that to, to understand the, the global pictures too and not just be looking at our own little town. Mm -hmm. that is connected to the whole world. Right. And um, Richard Florida has written a book recently that uh, addresses that problem head on and people see its relevance. And of course Richard Florida, uh, I, I was there when, in Toronto when you and he were there and that was a that was very interesting uh, time and I, I see that you are, you know, once again talking about the importance of creativity and the importance of self-knowledge as a society, as a city, as a society, as, as a culture. And you also mentioned democracy as the ways that are going to keep us from hopefully falling into another dark age. Mm -hmm. Except that if democracy uh, takes too short a view which uh, frequent elections uh, encourage. If um, political life assumes that nothing is worth doing unless it can make a big splash before the next election, that undermines democracy. That's for sure. And I just, I think, I can't, I can't see my hand signals, but I think that we're getting close to the end here. And we've we've seen that there is there is doom and gloom. Oh, sorry, we've got a, we have a, okay. I didn't see. Okay, but we'll hear. We have two more questions. We can hear those. Is that okay with you, James? Sure. Okay. I think like the uh, like the lady who was just up before us. We uh, I have a concern about uh, bridging the gap between local and global issues and uh, concerning sociology. My name is Jason O'Brien. I'm involved in the newly formed community group called Moby. It sounds from my own backyard, as opposed to the NIMBY. Uh, <laughs> a, group of a, a group of citizens in my neighborhood were uh, subjected to the, uh, a barrage of garbage and pollution due to, uh, due to unkept dumpsters. And we got a petition together that the dumpsters removed, and as a result, I decided to form a community group to look out for these types of social issues that affect us on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, through this coordination of people, we've managed to make uh, really good contacts with different people um, in our community, with merchants. And uh, I think the, the main issue is, while we're in our infancy and we're creating a structure um, to deal with municipal issues, how would we also create a structure that potentially could be used as a template for other communities um, across North America that could perhaps look at this uh, involving different educational structures and do you know of 
good systems between grassroots organizations and municipal political groups that, uh, that you could recommend that we would follow? Okay, uh, that's a complicated question. Okay, um, he, he's with a newly formed community group that's dealt with some issues in the community, and they call it MV, In My Backyard, as opposed to Moby. My own backyard. My own backyard. And instead of NIMBY, not in my backyard. And what he wants to know is how does a grassroots organization then also be able to deal with, say, a municipal organization that, that shares similar beliefs and maybe even larger, you know, federal or global? And do you have any examples? Well, I, I know of examples that encompass whole cities. And, but I don't know of examples that encompass whole countries, um, much less the whole globe at once. But these things can grow. Look, something has to ha happen, whatever it is, someplace, which means in a locality. And that's where things start, where creativity starts. And I like the idea of eliminating the notion of NIMBY. That's a very nasty, snobbish um, insult to most people. Um, not in my backyard. Refers to things that shouldn't be in anybody's backyard. And um, govern, governments should learn from that. And they should learn to be creative enough uh, to eliminate them. You shouldn't have a polluted water supply anywhere, uh, let alone in anybody's backyard. Um, you shouldn't have the, the bad smells that people worry about coming into their community. Uh, like a pulp mill that smells very bad, or a slaughterhouse, or penned, large pen, numbers of penned animals, uh, meat packing places for those reasons, are very bad in anybody's backyard. And in my own backyard, I don't know whether, from what the questioner said, whether it means that they're going to be martyrs. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might be, but I don't think that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well okay. Then, then the best way, uh, I think, to get the point across is to be creative enough to show how a problem, a practical problem, can be solved without uh, victimizing a locality. And if that can be shown, and it's economic and satisfactory. There's nothing that succeeds like success. And um, successful creativity spreads. Um, places learn to adopt these things. And the, um, by the way, the, this is by the way, but it's an important by the way, I think. Um, one of the great values of performance zoning is that if the, the um, an industry or what, any kind of organization uh, successfully uh, doesn't go in for bad performance, it has great freedom of location, of desirable location. That's that's the reward, and it's a, it's a very good reward. 
We have our final question. Hi, Mr. Jacobson. I'm Tracy Penner. I'm a local landscape designer specialized in environmental design. And my question is more um, uh, by way of asking for advice. How would you advise uh, somebody in city politics to answer a question where it, the uh, problem was so controversial they knew for sure that even though the right answer um, maybe to take a stand, they would probably lose their next term. Uh, so an example would be, for example, our rapid transit system right now, where we try again north-south rapid transit line, and we just um, killed the idea because it was terribly expensive to put it in the corridor that might have um, caused the least political damage. But we've actually got an empty, more or less abandoned rail line at Woodward, except that it happens to back onto the property of the people who pay the highest taxes in the city. And so, for that reason, um, Because whoever takes the stand says, no, it, the rapid transit system that we desperately need has to go on that rail corridor, probably won't have a future in politics. So what is your advice on those types of issues in city planning that require that kind of stand? What would you advise? Okay, I, I'm going to slightly change your question. <laughs> okay. No, but seriously, stay there for a second, okay, to make sure that, because it's too complicated, the rail line you know, without Jane being here and knowing all the ins and outs of it. But let me try to put it in a, what you're trying to say. I know enough of the ins Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Did you hear the question well enough? Well, I, I didn't hear it as a coherent single thing, but I heard city councilors. I heard... <laughs> yeah. Uh, I heard transit, and I heard... Uh, I heard the emotion. Uh, you know, I had a subtext that I was noticing from the beginning. When I said I didn't like good words to be co-opted for me, and then the opposite done. I think that's the case with Rob. I think that it's a black hole into which um, limited amounts of traffic funds and transit funds will be poured and uh, other ones neglected. Um, other ones that are very much needed. I think that it's a pork barrel. I think the pork barrel is for Bombardier. <laughs> and one reason I think that is that they tried this in Toronto, too. <laughs> and the senior governments are very, um, this is your big danger, they are very uh, apt to grant money for something that is going to be a good pork barrel for uh, Bombardier. I don't know exactly why, except that they think it pleases Quebec. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if it does please Quebec. <laughs> but whether it does or not, it is not a good reason for settling on a certain kind of transit without experimenting without knowing, uh, is this the most economical method? And especially, is this, are these the right routes? There's been very, this is part of dumb down taxes. There has been very um, sad experience of re in the last generation of um, uh, ill-planned routes, transit routes. This is part of the onset of a 
that a genuine onset of a genuine dark age. The traffic engineers have forgotten how to plan uh, successful routes. Uh, they used to know how. I mean, their ancestors, the <laughs> ancestors used to know how. It was quite simple and straightforward. Uh, they looked where the buses were most heavily used, and then they uh, noticed those routes. And if they were going to spend money for a more expensive transit system, like light rail, or the most expensive of all, uh, a subway, they put it where life had already demonstrated that transit, uh, lots of users wanted transit there and could use it. Now, this shows up in the fare box uh, in the earnings of the transit thing, but it's much more important that it shows up as what uh, people, whether they're being well served. Uh, a nasty thing that happens when you have the wrong route is that the, well, it doesn't meet expectations of ridership because it's, it's not the place people most want uh, transit and can use it most. And therefore, um, since it's not um, obviously um, the most wanted services cut, and then still fewer people use it because the service is poor, the frequency is poor. And the ridership goes down again. This is a real vicious spiral and has occurred in many, many cities. And as for bad routes, we have one in, we have several in Toronto. And they were all chosen for political reasons of various kinds, not for good transit. And we have, um, and Detroit did this, and Buffalo did this, um, Atlanta did this, Atlanta and I think Chicago and Detroit were influenced in their poor roots by racism. Uh, which is a far worse thing in the United States and a far more demanding uh, thing than it is in Canada. In Canada, there are other reasons. Uh, but they were not good for transit. Uh, I think that the, the RAV situation does not really address, is this the best route in which to spend the fairly limited uh, amount of money for transit? And we're back at the first question from the audience, which is what can uh, people do to people in cities and city government do uh, that helps the planet, the world, uh, places outside of cities. Certainly building wasteful transit uh, systems does not benefit the world or the planet. And another thing that is very similar here, and this is why I understand some of the ins and outs, um, is that who does um, get the benefit of uh, politically determined, uh, not good route, not most economical thing. Who gets it besides Bombardier, um, which is an expensive system compared to others? Um, <coughs> 
Well, in Toronto, it's been very secret who gets the benefit. But it comes out of little, little points. There are uh, casino operators who are going to get the benefit of it. It really isn't about transit. It's about um, providing, subsidizing uh, infrastructure that can be used by uh, junkets uh, for gamblers. And I'm not against gambling, but I don't think this is a proper use of transit funds. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's it. Thank you all very much. <laughs>